All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the spring eco-friendly pest management. I'm Suzanne Bontempo, and I'm joined here by Charlotte. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. We're going to talk, uh, yeah, eco-friendly spring pest management today. And thank you to the Alameda Countywide Clean Water Program for hosting us today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about all uh, about for an hour, and then we'll have qu time for questions at the end. Uh, we are going to talk about the Our Water Our World program, integrated pest management, kind of uh, having an understanding of pests and pesticides. We'll talk specifically about some pests that we see in the spring. Um, and then, of course, we will give you some additional resources at the end. And usually there's also resources sent out too, um, hopefully. <laughs> All right, so feel free to put your questions in the Q&A and we will either answer them as we go or we will save them till the end to share with out loud with everyone. And today we're brought to you by the Alameda Countywide Clean Water Program, which works to protect Alameda County, County creeks, wetlands, and the bay from runoff that may carry pollutants into the waterways. Related to gardening, that means avoiding chemicals that can be washed off the lawn and garden and into the storm drains by irrigation and rain. You can learn more about the program at cleanwaterprogram.org and you can sign up to get to be on their newsletter um, email list. On the right hand side, there's a way to sign up there and you'll get um, notified about upcoming events uh, like these webinars and other events related. And if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Um, if it's your, not your first time joining us, also welcome. Um, but I just want to share that we have done many, many uh, webinars with the Clean Water Program of Alameda County. And if you are interested in hearing or watching any of those webinars, we've done them literally for like four years now. So we have a lot, on um, a library of uh, many topics. You can go onto their YouTube channel, uh, it's Clean Water Program Alameda, or something like that. You'll type it in and you'll find it. Um, you can learn about pollinators, soil, uh, drought proofing your garden, veggie gardening, rose care, a lot of different um, subjects that we've covered through over the years. So if uh, you're missing anything today, you want more info, go back and check it out. We've probably covered it. And if you have suggestions for other topics that we haven't covered, feel free to contact us at the end or send in um, a chat. And now the um, Our Water Our World program is a uh, award-winning program and it's focused, it's primarily a clean water program with the goal of reducing pesticide pollutants uh, in our waterways. And it is primarily a partnership between water agencies and retailers. Um, like hardware stores and garden centers, designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality and provide pest problem solving education. Um, so you can see materials in stores and you can have, you can take handouts like that rack on the right. Uh, there's usually a rack of handouts that you can take. There's sometimes QR code posters. You can scan to get that information on your phone. You can see most stores have those blue tags on the shelves highlighting the less toxic products. Um, and then you can also learn more. You can see all of our fact sheets and learn more about less toxic products at ourwaterourworld.org. So we're a clean water program focused on pesticide reduction. What is the connection? Uh, when water from rain or irrigation uh, you know, hits the soil or the hardscaping doesn't soak into the soil, it runs off into the street and down storm drains. Uh, the water that goes uh, into the storm drains uh, will directly go right to a waterway without any treatment in between. This means that everything we do out in the world, whether it's spraying pesticides, washing our car, walking our dog, has a direct line to a waterway. And it's our water world's mission to reduce the potentially hazardous materials that go down the storm drain. And we do this through primarily through teaching integrated pest management. Um, men, if you've seen us before, you've uh, heard us talk about IPM. Um, this 
uh, py pyramid kind of shows the principles of IPM by most important to the least utilized tools or strategies. So prevention is the foundation of pest management um, and what we as homeowners and gardeners should be focused on. Prevention will reduce most pest issues. Uh, from there, we focus on uh, the health of the environment with cultural practices and sanitation. Uh, we utilize physical or mechanical controls like traps, barriers, and tools. Biological controls focus on the health and diversity of the ecosystem, utilizing natural enemies uh, to reduce pests. And then at the tippy top, the least utilized, uh, the small section would be, um, as a last resort, the chemical controls or pesticides. So again, prevention is the most important part of uh, dealing with pests. You can get ahead of a lot of pests out there. So uh, first, it, what, what prevention looks like in the garden is just good garden maintenance. So we're gonna identify what plants grow well in our climate or in our region or in our yard and choose the right plants for our yard. Uh, those plants will be better adapted and healthier and just easier to manage. We're going, and of course we're going to you know, plant them so they have enough space and the right sun and the right water as well. We're gonna to use tools like drip irrigation, row cover, or like wire barriers uh, to prevent pests, uh, either to you know, keep our plants really healthy or to prevent pests from getting to our plants. Rotating our crops um, is gonna be really helpful to reduce especially those veggie pests uh, that can overwinter in the soil. So trying to plant put food in different areas in the, in the garden, uh, you know, mix up that soil, well, not mix up the soil, but plant different plants in the same area, or <laughs> yes, in the different areas. Sorry, that was confusing. Um, light pruning, um, harvesting food crops, just general sanitation, getting rid of diseased plant material can prevent a lot of pests and disease. Um, understanding what pests are expected and when, uh, be ready for them, you know, talk to your neighbors, monitor your garden closely, understand pest life cycles, will understand what you have to do um, at different times of the year to get ahead of pests. And then utilizing horticultural oils or fungicides during the dormant season can also prevent or reduce pest issues. You're on mute. Suzanne, you're on mute. I knew I was going to do that. I have been waiting for the seasonal outburst of aphids to show up and it hasn't really happened yet. So I'm thinking, boy, is my prevention tactic so good that I have reduced aphids significantly? I don't know. I don't think that's the truth. I just don't know what's going on. But what is a pest? So for us home gardeners, a pest is an organism uh, typically, uh, an insect, uh, some people will consider spiders a pest, but you know, they are actually very beneficial, but it's usually an insect that annoys us, maybe a fly or a mosquito that flies around our head when we're trying to enjoy some time outside or something that's going to damage food and flowers. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes what might be a pest to us, which is maybe just a nuisance, is not doing any harm to the plants themselves. So we really want to understand our different thresholds of tolerance. So proper, proper identification is key. We want to understand what is really going on. I actually, I don't want to say I get excited, but I do appreciate when I see a pest in my garden because that is actually telling me or showing me that something else is going on. And until I can identify what really is going on, then I can't really solve that problem. And that pest or that surplus of that insect is actually, you know, telling me a story. But then from there, uh, we want to uh, understand the life cycle of that pest and then understand if it's something that's going to uh, kind of work through its life cycle and correct itself over a short period of time, such as spittle bugs. They just kind of always show up in April, but then after a couple of weeks, they just disappear. So they've completed their life cycle without doing any harm to my plant, to my plants. And then we want to understand if there's any 
uh, predators or other beneficial insects out there that will uh, help keep the uh, balance. So in this photo here, we have two caterpillars that are feeding on the leaves of the plants. The one on the left is the monarch butterfly caterpillar. Monarch butterfly, we can all identify as something that's cherished and loved and we're trying to protect. The caterpillar on the right is not as recognized, in fact, is oftentimes categorized as a horned worm, such as a tomato horn worm or a tobacco horn worm, which we view as a pest. However, if we let it complete its life cycle, it turns into a sphinx moth or a hummingbird uh, moth, which is a very important pollinator. So the question here, is it a pest or is it a pal? And then here we have uh, photos of an insect that looks very similar, but in fact, they're two different insects. We have the mealybug destroyer, destroyer that feeds on mealybugs and other soft-bodied insects. It is a cousin of lady beetle. And then we also have a flea beetle that looks very similar. They're both very tiny, so they can easily be mistaken. But the flea beetle is actually feeding on our leafy greens, on the foliage of seedlings and other plants. So one is actually beneficial, acting as a predator, managing pest problems in our garden, and the other is actually the pest. Really hard to identify. And then in this uh, uh, photo, group of photos, we have a couple of things going on. Uh, someone actually that joined our program questioned some of these little nodes or bumps that were on their ornamental plum out at the sidewalk. Well, when we took a closer look at the photos, we saw that the photo on the left actually has, uh, it is actually a lady beetle pupa. And the photo on the right is the pictures of the soft scale insect, which is what the ladybugs, the ladybug larvae, the ladybug pupa, which is transitioning into the adult lady beetle, they're feeding on. So we advise them not to do anything, just let the life cycle complete itself, that it's actually the lady beetles are keeping the soft scale in check, so to speak. And then this is a very common one that we have uh, seen a lot of this year because we've had such a cold, wet spring. We have uh, some photos here. They might look very similar, but there's actually two different things going on. The photo on the bottom is actually peach leaf curl, which is a fungal disease that only attacks peaches and nectarines. And then the photo on the top right is actually aphids, which are insects that are sucking the juices out of that leaf, puckering that leaf, creating that leaf, causing it to curl and to get this little red blush. So though they look similar, they are very uh, different uh, problems. One is a disease, the other is an insect. So the management would be two different solutions. One we would treat with a fungicide, the other we would treat with an insecticide. And then um, something else, since it is spring, we might notice that one of our plants might be hit really heavily with a very large population of aphids where a plant right next to it may not. And oftentimes that is very curious and we might wonder why. I've got two roses side by side, but one just happens to be completely covered with aphids. So. We want to take a closer look and understand that something else is going on. This is what I was getting at a couple moments ago. So that rose, either maybe the irrigation is broken or maybe it got buried a little too deep or maybe there is uh, some gopher nibbling at the root zone. Maybe there is some other root damage. Um, maybe we've been feeding heavily with synthetic fertilizers, but perhaps this rose is slightly downslope. So most of the fertilizer is landing at the root zone of this plant. Hard to say, but those are just some examples of what we look at when we see uh, plants that are inundated with a, a population of aphids to this extreme. Maybe the plant is at the end of its life cycle too. So it's not unusual to see kale or chard that's already uh, bolted, getting covered with aphids. But the good news is, is that aphids and other pests are very host specific. Uh, so typically when we have aphids on a rose like this, we don't have to worry about these aphids going to maybe the zinnias in the area or the dahlias in the area or your leafy greens. They're going to really stick to just that one plant. 
And uh, it is really important to understand the why, why this might be happening, get a little curious. Uh, and then and that's something else to keep in mind is that there might be just lack of beneficial insects in the area that would help keep the balance. So you'd want to do what you can to increase the beneficial insects in that area. Which beneficial insects are pollinators or predators are um, parasitic wasps and others are going to um, and expand out to our Western fence lizards or birds. These are all helping us keep that balance, helping us grow that healthy garden ecology. So uh, keep in mind that some pests are seasonal and to be expected, but these pests are actually food for that ecology that we're trying to build, that we're trying to establish. So uh, for me, I actually get excited when I see some aphids. In fact, I'm quite disappointed, believe it or not, right now that I don't have more because I want to make sure that there is enough food for the beneficial organisms that are coming into my garden, all of the natural enemies that are looking forward to that food. I want to make sure there's enough for them. Um, but as I just shared in the previous screen, that an infestation of a pest can actually be a clue that the plant is stressed and that there's another problem going on. So it's a good time just to get cu curious and take a closer look. All right. So some of you might have seen that previous picture and been like, ah, we got to spray something on it. <laughs> that's, that's a totally normal reaction. Um, we have been kind of conditioned to uh, think that pesticides are the answer and the main sort of mode of control in pest management. Um, and yes, Pesticides can be helpful in certain situations. They do kill the pests, but they're just one component of the, the solution. So later in the program, we will talk about different pest problems and how to manage them with other uh, strategies, but also mention, of course, the less toxic pesticides that can be effective. Um, so I just want to clarify, what is a pesticide? Um, a pesticide is really a... a product or a material designed to kill something. Um, and that encompasses, uh, so pesticide is the broad term that includes insecticides, includes herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, molluscicides, miticides, um, anything. Uh, and it can be made of natural and organic materials, you know, uh, of, you know, natural oils, essential oils, um, or it can be synthetic. But all of those uh, fall under the category of pesticide. And um, yeah, as Suzanne mentioned, pesticides do kill pests, but they don't solve the problem. You always kind of have to go back to the why this is happening. Pests are often the symptom of a problem, um, but they're not, that using a pesticide is not necessarily the solution. It's definitely not the long lasting solution. So when we use pesticides, we're going to use them as a last resort. We're gonna choose the least toxic and most eco-friendly product available to us. Uh, we're gonna apply according to the label. We're always gonna wear our PPE. That doesn't need, mean you need like a hazmat suit. It just means you wanna protect your, your hands, your eyes, your lungs, um, You know, certain products still, even if they are eco-friendly, they still can cause harm. So you do wanna make sure you're properly covered. Um, and you want to understand the risks and unintended consequences of the pesticide, uh, not just to you. Yes, there are risks to us, our children, but also to pets, uh, to the soil, to um, and other garden uh, organisms. Those good bugs in the garden can be harmed, again, by eco-friendlies can still harm those good bugs and have um, unintended consequences. So we always want to make sure if we're trying to kill something, there's usually another, you know, risks on the side that we need to understand. So just a few tips for using pesticides. We're going to know our pests. We're identifying that pest and only targeting that pest. We're not just going to spray around the garden just in case. We really want to keep it targeted. We're going to understand the timing um, and know the pest life cycle so that we are applying the pesticide when it's going to be most effective. Uh, we want to understand, and this also goes in hand, we want to understand the active ingredient of the pesticide and how it works. This will also help us apply at the best time. We're going to avoid applying when plants in, are in bloom. This is because, we, you know, when plants are in bloom, 
there's lots of pollinators coming to the garden. Um, they want to get that nectar, that pollen. They, we want them there so that they can pollinate our plants and our fruits, our flowers and our fruit. Um, but uh, uh, pesticides, even eco-friendlies can harm them. So we don't want to apply uh, just to reduce that risk. We are going to apply at dusk um, and in uh, temperatures lower than 85 degrees. Uh, I would say there's a Except for herbicides, herbicides do better in sun and heat, but everything else we want to apply at dusk, this will reduce risk to uh, the beneficial insects and will reduce risk to our plants so that they don't get burned. Uh, of course, we're never applying when there's a breeze or when it's super hot or there's gonna be rain or frost. This will reduce plant stress, keep the pesticide where we want it. Um, and then if we do want to release beneficials or we are trying to attract beneficials to the garden, uh, I would definitely, you know, give them time to arrive and to find the pests and to do their thing before we move on to using a, um, a pesticide. Um, and now different types of pests require different management. So again, we always have to identify the pests first. And then if you learn more about that pest, you will learn kind of how they are, uh, you know, harming your plant. Uh, there are insects called like sucking or that have sucking or piercing mouth parts. These would be like aphids, white fly nymphs, um, scale. Uh, these would be... Um, managed by just, you know, mostly wiping them off. They don't move very fast. So you can just wipe them off or syringe them off with water, a strong stream of water on your hose. Uh, they're very susceptible to beneficial. So, uh, you know, ladybugs can eat 5,000 aphids in their lifetime. So bring in those ladybugs, those lace wings. Um, we're going to avoid synthetic fertilizers because uh, synthetics grow thinner cell walls, making the plants easier to eat and therefore more attractive to the pest. Uh, we're going to irrigate uh, properly, we're going, and then if we do want to use a pesticide, we're going to maybe first use an insecticidal soap um, or a horticultural oil. And then if we have chewing pests, again, chewing damage can look like a lot of different pests can cause chewing damage, not just insects. So again, we're going back to that identification like birds, mice, snails, uh, you know, caterpillars, a lot of things cause chewing damage. So we want to identify, but if we see specifically like caterpillars can definitely munch our plants very quickly. We're going to remove them by hand. We're going to work with barriers or traps. We might use beneficial nematodes um, in the soil if that is part of the life cycle of the pest. Uh, Bt is a bacteria. It's used as a pesticide, uh, can be eaten by some of those pests and um, kills them that way. Also spinosad or spinosad similarly needs to be eaten. And then if we have a chewing and crawling insect, which could be something like beetles, earwigs, or slugs, uh, we're also going to remove them by hand, work with maybe copper tape barriers or other barriers. Traps are very effective, especially for slugs and earwigs. Um, diatomaceous earth is a fine chalky powder that we can put on the soil and um, it kills them in a like a physical way. Um, and then iron phosphate or iron phosphate with spinosad, uh, those are granular baits that can be used on the soil and they're um, they're naturally occurring in the soil, like iron phosphate is naturally occurring in the soil. So it's not harmful to the soil if it kind of just melts back in and isn't eaten, but it is very effective for snails and slugs. And then just a couple notes about some very common uh, pesticides that we see on the shelves. Um, again, we want to know how they work. And these are just three of them. So if you're using something different, I recommend uh, looking that up and we'll give you resources to read about them. Insecticidal soap, excellent, um, you know, very low toxicity product. Uh, it is the inactive ingredient is potassium salts of fatty acids. It is a contact spray or contact kill. Um, so it is, it basically is sprayed on these soft bodied insects like aphids and white fly nymphs, and it kind of melts their exoskeleton. So the pest needs to be there and you need to spray them directly. Um, and it is very narrow spectrum. It only kills the soft bodied insects. So things like beetles uh, won't be affected. And I want to be clear that insecticidal soap 
the stuff we buy on the shelf in the labeled container is not the same as dish detergent. Um, I will, and I'll talk about a little bit more about that on the next slide, <laughs> but it's not the same thing. Um, then there's neem oil, very popular product. Most products are, the active ingredient is clarified hydrophobic extract of neem oil from a neem seed. Um, it is also a contact kill and it acts as a suffocant. So basically anything it kind of comes in contact with, it acts, uh, it kind of just coats it and suffocates it. Um, so therefore it's more broad spectrum. It can harm more, um, more insects not just the soft-bodied ones. Um, it can har harm a wider range of insects. It can be used as an insecticide, a miticide, and a fungicide for certain fungal diseases, especially um, powdery mildew. And then um, spinosad or spinosad, again, I never know how to say it, um, is a bacteria that when consumed, it disrupts the insect's neurotransmission. It is naturally occurring in soil um, or it's yeah, not all soil, but some. Um, it needs to be ingested. So again, we have contact kills, we have suffocate, also a contact kill, and then we have something that needs to be ingested. So we need to spray it where the pest is and is actively eating so that it gets to it. It is broad spectrum. It kills a wide range of insects, um, insects with chewing or rasping mouth parts. So those caterpillars, um, thrips and uh, many others. Um, but we again, we're reading the label. On the label, it does share that spinosad is limited to six applications a year. Uh, we need to adhere to those limitations because if we push it, um, go over that, we are risking um, pesticide re uh, a resistance. So we don't want to go over that limit. Those limits are in place for a reason. And then I will make a note, I already mentioned the dish soap, uh, making our own pesticides at home, yes, sounds like a good idea. It's stuff from our kitchen, we already have it on hand. It's gotta be you know, less toxic because it's not a pesticide. But again, anything designed to kill a pest is a pesticide. Um, and these DIY remedies are um, potentially more risky um, and also often less effective than the things that we can buy on the shelf. They don't have labels on them to show you how to apply, how to mix it, how often to apply and any risks or any precautions we need to take. Um, and often they're really just, the, we're making up recipes, so they're really just often not effective. I wanted to note that dish soap, the you know common dish soap that we have is a detergent, not soap. So it's, it's different than insecticidal soap. Dish soap uh, or detergents have degreasers in them, um, you know, to take the grease off of pans. Over time, those degreasers will harm uh, leaf tissue um, and harm, you know, your plants over time. So we don't recommend using those detergents. They also have some ingredients or some of them have ingredients in them that can cause um, aquatic toxicity. Salt, uh, overusing salt is can be detrimental to the soil, worms, and other soil organisms. And then vinegar, very commonly used as a weed killer. Um, household vinegar, the stuff we put on our salad is about 5% acetic acid. Uh, I know some people try to use it as a weed killer and say it works, but it's unlikely that that level of acetic acid is gonna work as an herbicide. Most horticultural vinegar is 20 to 30% acetic acid. And um, at that level, we're taking great risk when we're using it. Yes, it can be an effective, less toxic uh, uh, herbicide for sure, but we do need to have uh, use precaution when we do apply it because at that 20 to 30% level, it can burn our skin, uh, cause blindness, and is corrosive to metals. So again, we wanna be covering up, not using it when uh, you know there's wind, um, or any way that it can go where we don't want it to go. Back to you, Suzanne. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay, so what a great foundation to when we use pesticides. All right, so I'm going to walk us through some of our common pests that we see this time of the year. So aphids. Aphids are the most common pests we're going to see in the garden. There's actually over 5,000 species of aphids worldwide. 
uh, remarkable. Um, they're going to vary in color. Some have wings, most do not. They have straw-like piercing mouth parts that puncture the plant's cell wall to access those sugary juices to the plant. So when Charlotte said to avoid use, using synthetic fertilizers because they grow thinner cell walls, that's exactly what's going on. We, that's why we uh, talk so much about the benefits of feeding with organics and building that healthy soil. It's going to grow thicker cell walls so the pests like aphids cannot access those sugary juices. Um, um, I'll also say that each color aphid is very host specific. So it's not unusual for that ole um, oleander aphid, which is golden, the one in the middle, to show up on our milkweeds and other plants that are in that family. That limey green one will show up on our roses um, and some other flowering plants. The one on the bottom, which is uh, the woolly aphid, is that one happens to be, oh, it's the cabbage aphid. I'm sorry, I got it mixed up. It happens to be on the tomatoes and other brassicas, even though tomatoes on a brassica, they just happen to like it. So we start to see this pattern. And that's why when we say they're host specific, they're not necessarily going to go to other plants outside of their feeding kind of zone or their, their menu that they, their preferences. So some aphid solutions, we're going to, you know, uh, be sure that when we feed our plants, we're feeding organically, we're building that healthy uh, root zone by adding compost to the soil and just really making that root zone is getting everything it needs. We're going to avoid regular pruning or over pruning because when we prune plants, it stimulates new growth and that new growth has a thinner cell wall, which makes it very easy for uh, pests like aphids to uh, access. Uh, ants love to uh, farm the honeydew secretions that the aphids make. And so if we see ants trailing up a plant, it is not unusual that those ants are telling us that there's going to be something up there like aphids or maybe uh, scale insects or something else that secretes uh, sugary juices. So we want to um, say thank you ants for telling me that there's another pest that I need to tackle, but then we want to manage those uh, ants by maybe making a pest barrier with something like tanglefoot or some type of a sticky barrier that we can then remove from the branch of that plant. And then we absolutely want to inv invite beneficial insects. I have a lot of insectary plants around my garden that will attract the beneficials, oftentimes the adult is actually looking for pollen or nectar, and they will only lay eggs if they see that there's a nice clutch or population of uh, aphids or other pests for their young to feed on. And then if we need to use a pesticide, uh, if we've already tried uh, wiping off those aphids or blasting them off with water, then we can work with insecticidal soap. Uh, applying it in accordance to the label. That's always my first go-to, but horticultural oil will also, also work. And if it's something that's on like deciduous fruit trees or roses, we just maybe got our uh, apple tree, for instance, just got a very large population of the woolly apple aphid. Then we want to take note and this next fall when all those leaves drop and it goes into its dormant season, we want to take advantage uh, and apply a dormant application of a horticultural oil. And then uh, this is probably the most popular pest in my garden right now that I'm not excited about, which are going to be earwigs. And then the pill bugs or the roly polies would be second. Uh, what happens is when we have a lot of moisture in the garden, um, we are going to actually attract these two types of insects, uh, they're going to cruise around and eat our leaves of our plants and our little uh, vegetable starts and maybe even our ripe strawberries. So some solutions for the earwigs and roly polies are reduce the moisture, which might sound uh, impossible. Uh, we have very uh, moist evenings right now. There's a lot of moisture in the morning. So we want to be mindful that we're not adding to that by irrigating again. Or when we do irrigate, we're going to make sure we're watering in, in the morning and during those sunrise hours so that the garden can actually dry out before sundown. Because it's the evening when these 
uh, these critters are most active. And then another very effective way to manage earwigs and the pill bugs is with traps. We can purchase earwig traps. We can make our own. This is when it's okay to make your own on the UC IPM website. If you look up earwig management, there is a recipe how to make an earwig trap with a little can and with a little bit of water, a couple drops of that dish detergent, because we don't mind if it's dish detergent, and then a couple drops of something that's fishy, like fish sauce, fish emulsion, or maybe um, something that might be similar attractant. And for the pill bugs or the little roly pullies, they like the beer traps, just like the slugs and snails. But there's other products that are available out there, such as the diatomaceous earth that works really effectively, making barriers around those plants and applying products like the Sluggo Plus or the Bug and Slug Killer. Uh, these are going to be iron phosphate uh, baits with that spinosad or spinosad. And then citrus leaf miner, we're going to start to see that. That seems to start to increase around May when the temperatures warm up. The adult is actually a little moth. She's quite pretty, but tiny. Um, and then uh, when that new growth has, uh, that new flush of growth has occurred on the citrus, she will lay her eggs underneath those leaves. Those eggs will hatch. And then the larvae will uh, mine between the two layers of that leaf. So making it very difficult if we want to use pesticides. Um, when we're using high nitrogen fertilizers, we're actually increasing a lot of that leafy growth. So keep that in mind. Um, but uh, typically a uh, minor infestation of the leaf miner is not gonna harm the tree. We're really looking at about the 10 to 15% range will be the tolerance. If it's any more, we will wanna take some action. So some solutions for citrus leaf miner will be um, prevent plant stress, feed with organics, make sure we're watering deeply and we're letting that root zone dry out some before we water again. We can um, try if understand that there's parasitic wasps. That's what this picture is. This is a parasitic wasp that's very, very tiny um, and it doesn't sting, but in fact, the uh, the stinging apparatus, the ovipositor, is actually now uh, dropping eggs into the larva of the citrus leaf miner, and then those eggs will hatch, and they'll feed the in, uh, feed the inside of the, that larvae, and then emerge as an adult uh, parasitic wasp. So they're using the pest as a host, as part of their life cycle. So this is very exciting. Um, and another reason why we want to avoid using pesticides because the parasitic wasps are in the area and they are actively keeping the balance. Uh, however, uh, if we need to use a pesticide, um, we can um, decide what the threshold tolerance is by one, monitoring. We use that. We we monitor with the citrus leaf miner traps. They have a lure that will attract the adult moth. And when we see that there is an abundance in the trap, that could be our timing to use a product such as Spinosad, which is that liquid pesticide um, that comes in the brand of Jack uh, Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew, Monterey Lawn and Garden, uh, garden insect spray. There's a couple other brands on the market, uh, but this is very effective, but we want to be very strategic because we are limited to only using it six times a year to prevent that pesticide resistance. We can also use uh, horticultural oils uh, like mineral oil, neem, organicide. These are going to also act as suffocants. And then the vegetable leaf miner, which is very different, but for us uh, vegetable uh, growers, we are going to start to see its activity as well as the temperatures get warm. And we see vegetable leaf miner on uh, chard, beets, spinach. Um, it might be on something else. I forget. I apologize. But uh, the larvae will overwinter in the soil. And as those soil temps and air temps warm, they will uh, emerge as the adult fly. The fly will then lay its eggs on the leafy greens. Those eggs will hatch. The larvae will then go in between the tissue and feed and make this kind of cellophane look to our leafy greens. So we want to go and actually just smash them. Very easy just to smash the larvae for the solutions. 
yeah, we can just go and see them. And there's a picture of the eggs on the chart, but uh, we can, if they are already present, we can just remove those leaves, move the infected parts of the plants, put them in a paper bag and roll that paper bag up or seal it and put it in the green can. We seal it so that the um, eggs won't hatch and the life cycle won't be completed. And then the fly will just fly out the next time we open up the green bin. We can use green, I'm sorry, we can use blue sticky traps, which will, uh, the adults are attracted to, which will reduce uh, some of the populations. And if we've never had leaf miner in that area, because so, we're rotating crops and we're now planting chard in a whole new area of the garden, we can actually put row cover over it and it will prevent the fly from coming and starting to lay eggs in that area. We happen to have the um, leaf miner on our property. We can always apply beneficial nematodes to the soil. They will feed off of the overwintering, overwintering larvae and break that life cycle. Next, we have spider mites, which as things start to dry out, we are going to start to see a lot of spider mites. Spider mites thrive in hot, dry conditions. Also, uh, when there is um, no breeze or poor air circulation, or when something is really overcrowded and it hasn't been pruned lately, or when we are feeding with synthetic fertilizers, or if we have used broad spectrum pesticides that actually increases the population of spider mites, believe it or not. Um, lack of predators, lack of beneficial insects is also going to see an increase. And they're very common on houseplants because houseplants are inside when things are warm and cozy or on other plants in the garden, such as buddleia, um, tomatoes. There are certain plants that are just prone to it. So some spider mite solutions are going to be, um, hey, let's just hose off that plant when things start to get warm and dry. Let's make sure when we are irrigating that soil, uh, when we're watering that plant, we are watering it to that plant's needs, which means letting that plant dry out between watering, watering it deeply, making sure it's not staying too wet or staying too dry. We are going to uh, thoughtfully prune to open up that air circulation. We're going to monitor for the pests and really tackle it at first sign. If we know that that Buddleia always gets uh, um, spider mites, then we want to get ahead of it and really like start to pay attention and you know address it as it is occurring. We are going to uh, feed organically and help those plants live their best life possible, and plant insectary plants in the area to attract those beneficials. And if we need to use a pesticide, we're going to start with uh, those narrow spectrum pesticides such as insecticidal soap, which should work perfectly. But then we can use other products like the horticultural oils. We can use the natural pyrethrin um, products that are blended with canola oil. One of those brands is going to be take down by Monterey. These will all work at, if we are applying them in accordance to the label. And then the next is going to be beetles uh, and weevils and other kind of problematic uh, uh, pests that chew our flowers and then they kind of wreck our flowers. Um, they're going to seem impossible, especially down in uh, the Fremont area. We seem to get the, the weevils are very popular down there and really have a tendency to do a number on our roses. But we are going to go out, uh, I like to call it the dusk insect walk, where I go around at dusk with my soapy bucket of water. And I really, it's just a little, you know, plastic container. And I'm literally just knocking them into the water because at the end of the day, the sun starts to go down, the temperatures start to cool. They get very slow and it is very easy just to knock them into the water. And it's quite gratifying to do that, to be honest. And our next pest here is mosquitoes. So a couple of things to keep in mind that there's over uh, 2,500 different species of mosquitoes throughout the world, of which about 150 species occur in the United States, 30, uh, 53 uh, species occur in California, and there are 22 of those that are here in Alameda County. Eight of those species are actually uh, the 99% uh, or the 99% of the complaints we get are just eight of those 
22 species. Uh, so that is really what we want to think about. Um, keep in mind that mosquitoes, the male is a pollinator. It's the female that is going for the blood feeding. Um, and they breed in the water. So how we would manage the mosquitoes is when we go outside, we want to wear protective clothing. And keep in mind, there are day feeders now. So some of those species are now feeding on, a, on us during the day. So when I go on a hike or if I'm in those areas where it might be more wooded or like marshy areas where there's a lot of water, I'm going to wear protective clothing. Uh, around my property, I want to empty any um, standing water. So if it's a saucer that's under a pot that just seems to collect water or if there is a tarp over a bicycle that always seems to collect water or maybe there is a tire or there's just some uh kids toys or a kid's swimming pool or anything a bucket anywhere in the garden that maybe collected some water over last week's rain then i want to make sure it's upside down that i've dumped it i want to make sure that we keep our doors and windows closed that we actually install screens screens that will prevent those flying insects from coming in. We want to inspect the rain gutters around our the perimeter of the roof because oftentimes if they get clogged, they will create a little pocket of uh, water where we can actually be breeding these these mosquitoes. Um, and then we absolutely want to use the larvicides, the mosquito dunks and mosquito bits and anything like a rain catchment system or a pond where the water is not circulating enough where the water needs to be there, but we just want to make sure that we're killing the larvae of those mosquitoes. And then flies. Flies are gonna be similar to the mosquitoes, but of course we're not looking for standing water. We just want to uh, inspect any sources that might be attracting them, like the garbage bins, any dead animals, pet waste, for instance. We want to use a lot, utilize those fly traps. They work extremely well. We want to make sure there's screens on the doors, screens on the windows, and make sure there's no holes in those screens, okay? Because they can fly through and fit through those little holes. And then putting a fan on, either installing a ceiling fan and having it on low or just a standalone fan, having it on low, actually will prevent flying insects from coming in the house because they are not strong flyers. And then fungus gnats. Fungus gnats are very problematic. They actually thrive on moist conditions and they feed on uh, decomposing organic matter, the fungus that is in the soil or the fungus that grows along the root zone of the plants when they are too wet. Okay, so how we correct it is that we are going to avoid overwatering. We're gonna let things dry out. In some cases, we may need just to completely replace the soil. Uh, we, If it's a house plant, we want to consider maybe a soilless planting medium, which is very common, uh, and that will definitely reduce it. We can use uh, sticky traps uh, that are going to, the adult fungus gnat will stick on and that will break the life cycle for obvious reasons. And we can also apply beneficial nematodes to the soil. They will feed on the larvae. We can also apply the mosquito bits, similar to the mosquito dunks and the same product we would use for the mosquitoes, the mosquito bits are also listed and registered for use for fungus gnats. They feed on it and it is very effective with killing them. So these are all great solutions for managing the fungus gnats. All right, now speaking of uh, overwatering, we will talk about some fungal diseases. Uh, the three most common uh, diseases that we will see on our plants, these are foliar diseases, uh, so they show up on the leaves, would be black spot, uh, which is looks exactly what it sounds like, little black spots on leaves. Rust would be a uh, reddish, um, orange, uh, looking color on the leaf. Um, and then powdery mildew would be like a white, uh, just looks like powder on the leaf. So pretty easy to identify these. Although, you know, sometimes, uh, I would say sometimes there's a little confusion with some um, environmental things, but for the most part, they're pretty easy to identify. And now, um, uh, overall, with all diseases, uh, fungal diseases, we want to increase the soil and garden health, healthier plants, 
will be able to fight off diseases if they do arrive, ensuring that the plants have good airflow uh, between them and within its own, within itself um, is gonna prevent most many diseases. And then anytime we do see any diseased foliage, we wanna remove it. Um, now, then there's a little bit of a split on how we treat powdered mildew versus rust and black spot. Um, powdered mildew is a kind of an unusual fungal disease in that it actually likes warmer, uh, drier conditions. So um, we'll actually start to see it later in the summer when um, the, the temperatures get uh, higher and there is less moisture in the air, though the um, Foggy, cool evenings plus warm days is actually like a really good combination for powdery mildew. So we are still gonna, we're going to start seeing it pretty soon. So because powdery mildew uh, doesn't like water and doesn't like moisture, uh, we can wash powdery mildew off with water, either with a hose or just wiping it off with a wet paper towel um, and do that early in the morning so that the plant can dry out before nightfall because then we don't want plants to be wet at night because plants that are wet at night can invite in other fungal diseases like rust and black spot, which thrive on moisture and cool temperatures. Um, so uh, we're going to make sure that we're not getting, you know, except for very carefully treating our powdery mildew, we're gonna try to avoid watering, getting water on the leaves. So we're gonna avoid over, overhead watering with like a, a sprinkler or a hose. And we want to reduce any splashback. So if we are just watering the soil, um, there's sometimes the water can splash up into the plant. So you can either switch to a soaker hose or drip irrigation, or just prune your plant up more off the ground so that water isn't going to splash onto the leaves. That will reduce your rust and your black spot. Very common on roses, especially. Then if we want to use some eco-friendly fungicides, there are several options on the market. There's um, sulfur, which can come in both a liquid or a powder. Uh, there's copper fungicide or copper soap, um, which can be applied out also as a dormant spray to reduce peach leaf curl. Neem oil can um, help with especially powdery mildew and maybe some other fungal diseases. And then there is a bacterial fungicide, um, Bacillus amyloliquefaciens, <laughs> I believe is how you say it. I practice that. Um, and that is uh, a bacteria that kind of works with the soil, works with the roots, works with like the, the plant cells to to increase immunity and fight off uh, diseases. And it can be used both as a soil drench for certain soil borne diseases and as a foliar spray for these powdery mildew, rust and black spot. Then we have gophers, which are the, you know, the least favorite thing. I, I don't like to talk about gophers because they're a huge problem across the entire Bay Area. Everyone deals with them and they're very hard to manage. The best way to deal with gophers, unfortunately, is with prevention, getting ahead of them, knowing that if you don't have them yet, you're gonna. So anytime we're putting a plant in the ground, we're going to put plants in gopher baskets because gophers tunnel under the soil and uh, eat plant roots. So again, if you're seeing plant damage and you're seeing mounds, that's likely a gopher. Um, if you're seeing mounds, but maybe no plant damage, you might need to inspect a little bit more. It could be a mole or something else. Um, so identification is important, but gophers do eat plants. Uh, so to prevent their roots being eaten, you're gonna use either half inch hardware cloth or gopher baskets or gopher wire. Um, if you're putting in a raised bed, you want to line the bottom all the way up the sides with half inch hardware cloth. Um, and then, you know, you can use traps to eliminate them. They are a little bit scary um, and kind of require a lot of patience, but they can be quite effective. And there are a lot of different style traps on the market as well. And then if you want to just try also a repellent, um, any castor oil based repellent like Mole Max, um, there's also a Victor uh, Mole and Gopher repellent. Um, they can be temporary deterrents, though I do uh, definitely recommend reading that label because it's not 
as simple as just dumping the repellent all over your yard. You're actually applying it in a certain way to push the gophers out of your property or at least out of an area. Um, and then exclusion frames are, of course, effective for gophers, but they can be effect or exclusion, sorry. <laughs> it can be effective for gophers, but also for many other uh, mammals and other critters in the garden. Uh, for, for preventing rats, mice, and voles, we're going to use quarter inch hardware cloth. Um, that's just the size that they can't fit through. Gophers, again, we're going to use half inch hardware cloth because gophers are a little bit bigger. If we're preventing squirrels and rabbits, we're going to use either three quarter inch hardware cloth or a poultry wire. And then if we have deer causing problems, we want to use uh, a seven foot tall fence or taller. I would think, and it also depends if you're on a slope, you want to be taller as well. A few other options for exclusion, you know, they can be very elaborate and tall that you could walk into. They can be custom for a raised bed. They can also be quite simple, just some PVC piping um, and some hardware cloth. They can also, there's that one in the middle that's just bird netting. So maybe just keeping birds out, but not worrying about other critters. Um, there's a lot of different ways to exclude pests in the garden. And then for our digging pests like cats and raccoons and skunks, uh, again, physical barriers are gonna be the best, uh, a really great option for you. Uh, covering the soil or the planting beds where they're digging, you can use um, what's called like a cat scat mat. That's for cats to kind of just, um, you know, bother their paws when they try to go to the bathroom on your planting beds. Uh, poultry wire can also be really effective because they can't dig, uh, which they like to do when they go to the bathroom. Um, so if they can't dig, they're not going to go or they're, and it's going to bother their paws. So they're going to go somewhere else. Um, you can also covering the whole, whole planting area with bird netting, either on the soil again or um, over the whole area too, to keep them out. Um, but, and this can help with raccoons digging as well, skunks kind of looking for grubs. Uh, if they can't physically dig, they're gonna try to find somewhere else to go. And then lastly, we're just gonna touch on a couple of invasive pests, uh, something to be aware of. Um, especially because, you know, camping season is kind of upon us now. So the easiest way to prevent invasive pests from moving, you know, from coming into your yard or from moving throughout the state is to not move firewood. So we're going to buy it where we burn it. If you're going camping, you're going to buy wood from your camp host or from the local store or the camp store. Um, and if you're burning at home, you can buy wood from a local grocery store or hardware store. So always buying the wood as close as you're going to burn it. Um, and then if you have citrus in your yard, you should be aware of this invasive pest, the Asian citrus psyllid, which um, can infect citrus with Wong Lung Bing disease. Um, it is present, These the psyllids and the disease are present in California, but are very carefully managed with quarantine areas. And there's a lot of restrictions about moving trees and fruit throughout the state. Um, so, but if you do have citrus in your own yard, you should familiarize yourself with what these look like. They're, um, the adult psyllid is really tiny. It looks like an aphid, uh, but it has a very unique kind of um, feeding. It always feeds at a 45 degree angle. Um, the juveniles have this like waxy tubules. Um, so it could look like, you know, mealybugs or something else, but with a closer look, you'll see that it's different. Um, and then, yeah, the eggs are hard to see. Uh, they're usually on the new growth on the folded leaves. Um, and then the disease, it, once the, with the tree is infected, the disease can look like um, mottled yellowing on the leaves, which unfortunately is very common on citrus. Citrus does often have yellowing uh, leaves, uh, so but that's often caused by nutrient deficiencies or watering issues. So again, just because you have yellowing um, blotches on your leaves doesn't mean you have this disease. You have to kind of inspect the tree. But if you ever... Do you suspect that you have the psyllid or the disease, you can call the CDFA hotline um, and I definitely do that if you really suspect it.
And then lastly, uh, the spotted lanternfly is not in California yet, thank goodness, because it can cause a lot of damage. It is in like the mid-Atlantic states. Um, it's a very invasive pest that has uh, many host plants, including grapes, hops, apples, stone fruits, uh, almonds. So we really don't want it in California, like really, really, really don't want it. Um, so we are really focusing on getting the word out. Early detection is critical. Um, it is a very beautiful moth. Um, the adult is very beautiful. It has two nymphs that are quite unique. And I've seen them in real life in New York, don't worry. And they move very crazy. They jump really high, far, hard to kill. And the egg masses, unfortunately, look, uh, they really blend in. They can look like lichen. So trying to familiarize yourself as much as you can. If you see anything that could look, look like it, definitely call the CDFA hotline immediately. And then um, you can also reach out to your, if you have any other questions about other invasive pests, you can talk to the UC Cooperative Extension. Uh, the office for Alameda County is in Hayward. Also in Hayward, the Agricultural Commissioner as well. So uh, reach out to them with questions. Lastly, we have our resources for you, the Our Water World website, the UC IPM website, which has tons and tons of um, information on pests in California. To learn more about those active ingredients that we talked about, you can go to NPIC, uh, National Pesticide Information Center, for really easy to understand info about um, pesticides and their how they work and how any risks that we need to be aware of. And then if you need to identify any bugs, I do recommend bugguide.net. It's a fun place to go to look at lots of pictures of bugs. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you for joining us. And uh, we are here for questions. There is our contact information. You're welcome to reach out to us and we'll hang out for a moment if you have any questions. Thank you so much. That was great. I'm gonna do.